You grew up with such a strong affinity for music, and there's so many different paths that you can take as a musician. How did that ultimately lead you to film, television, and the gaming industry? Yeah, well, I, you know, I started out like probably a lot of people. I uh, loved music as a little kid, and um, I, um, I was on a camping trip actually, and an uncle of mine brought along his acoustic guitar, and I was just obsessed with it. I was about, I think, five years old or so, and so he uh, he let me play it, and I just kind of had a natural knack for it, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I could just kind of kind of play and, and pick out melodies, and he had shown me a couple things, and I, you know, picked it up really quickly, and and so that was really when like I was like, oh, I love music, and and um, you know, my I was my grandfather purchased me a, a little three quarter scale guitar, uh, paid for a few lessons and things, and 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 but largely I kind of was self taught. Uh, and I just became obsessed. I would listen to music all the time. And so I thought I wanted to be, you know, in a band. And um, when I uh, when I was a teen, that's right when the 90s Seattle scene really was blowing up. And so I, I really latched onto that. That was, um, I just loved, you know, Nirvana and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and all these Seattle bands that were, had really blown up. And I lived about two hours away from Seattle. So I was like, I'm moving to Seattle. I'm gonna get in the band. I'm gonna be a famous rock star you know, rock guitarist, and here we go. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I moved to Seattle, uh, and I was playing in bands, but I also studied audio engineering and, and mixing and sound design and things at, um, at a school there called the Art Institute of Seattle. And so um, I had, and I got a job working at an audio post house when I was 19. So I was doing both of those things. And that's really when I started to become more aware of the fact that there's music in media that people are mm -hmm. hired to write music for commercials and for TV shows and movies and all those things. And, um, and I had, you know, I had grown up loving movies and loving film music, huge fan of the music from, you know, a lot of the John Williams, you know, Star Wars and E.T., yeah. Danny Elfman, Thomas Newman, you know, all these guys, I, and James Horner, love these scores. I had never considered doing that myself at that point in time. I was just so focused on this other thing. But when I uh, I got married uh, and um, you know the idea of being like on tour and not ever being home didn't mm. sound as appealing anymore. <laughs> uh, and you know I was um, watching a film with my wife and she was the one who said, "Have you ever thought about scoring a film?" Because I had been commenting on the music and how cool it was, and she just planted that seed. I was like, "Wow, that's a really interesting idea." And I had you know I didn't know how to work with an orchestra or anything like that. I had not gone to like a traditional music school. Um, so, uh, but I just, I bought a bunch of books and was really obsessed with that. And, uh, and then that led me to, um, studying under a, a man named Hummy Man who teaches a film scoring course up in the Pacific Northwest. Mm. And it was pretty new at the time. He'd been doing it for just a few years, I think. And so, uh, and now it's like a full master's program. So that's pretty neat. But, oh, yeah. uh, yeah, that was really like a crash course in like the craft of not just writing for an orchestra, but how to score a film. And uh, and how scoring really works from a fundamental you know, from from the craft aspect, and um, that really got me going. Uh, so that's that's you know basically what led me to uh, you know where I am now. That's so much success throughout your career. When you look back, is there a particular moment that stands out to you? Yeah, you know what th what really changed things for me early on um, was I was working at the studio and I was kind of you know the young one of the, I was the youngest guy there so I was kind of you know um, you work your way up and mm. so I was kind of in a position where I was I was you know mixing things but I wasn't getting the really like high level jobs at the time you know I was kind of getting the the uh, you know more of the just you know the early the easier projects i guess you know that were easier to mix not quite as high stakes but one day we got a call uh from a company called um digital kitchen uh and they were a big uh visual production shop in seattle they did the title sequences for nip uh i'm sorry for uh, yeah for nip tuck as well but also um six feet under they won emmys for this they were one of the i think the first production house that was said you know why not make the title sequence as artful and as cool as the show is itself, you know, mm. and so they did that and, and they were doing amazing work and everyone, you know, wanted to work with them. And they called and they had a project um, that they needed. They weren't happy with the with the audio. And it was a title sequence for a show called um, The Grid on TNT. And um, they were like, we do you have anybody available? They were talking to the, to the studio manager. Is anyone available there to, to do this? And we need it like tomorrow. And, or in two days or something. And, 
And uh, so I was the guy available. And so suddenly I'm doing this project and I asked them, hey, do you know, I'm, I'm a composer as well. Do you mind if I take this home and, and actually, you know, score it and sound design it? And they said, do whatever you want. And so I did and um, brought that back and they loved it. And they ended up getting an Emmy nomination that didn't win, but they got nominated for that. And that all of a sudden I was working with those guys a lot. And that's mm -hmm. where I met Dan Brown. He was one yeah. of the uh, visual effects guys on their team. And we, our first project together was a trailer for a video game. And, um, uh, you know, and we were both parts, part of a team essentially. Uh, so we weren't the only people working on it, but we did meet during that time and it sparked, um, a, you know, a 20 year relationship now. So, yeah. Or more, longer, maybe. Love that. I just chatted with Dan yesterday. You know, Your Lucky Day is coming out on November 10th. And this project originally started as a short film and it's now become a feature. And you you worked on both projects. What were some of those early conversations that you had with Dan as this narrative expanded in scope? Yeah, great question. I, um, you know, we, like you said, I scored the short in 2010. Um, it was just a few minutes of music. Um, you know, it's such a different format than a feature length. Yeah. You know, there's no real time to develop a theme or have any sort of like, usually not anyway, any sort of musical arc other than you're just kind of setting the tone, making sure you're hitting the right beats so that the film feel, so it feels right. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think there was just a few minutes of music in that score. When we spoke about the feature length, um, you know, it was, we basically tackled it like a whole new film. Uh, at least I did. And um, and so we had a long three hour, I'd say, conversation about the film, the themes of the movie, the feeling. I hadn't seen anything yet, um, but I knew it was shot and he was getting together a rough cut at that time. And um, but we just talked in general terms about what he wanted to convey in this film uh, and, and, you know, and any musical ideas that he did have. And we just kind of talked through that. Um, and, uh, and also at the time it was, you know, I hadn't seen him in a few years. It was right in the middle of COVID. And, and so, uh, it was kind of like a nice reunion as well. So it was just a, that was a really fun, fun day. Uh, at the very end of that conversation, he, um, I asked him, you know, is there anything that we haven't touched on, uh, that could, that would be important to you, you know, musically. Um, and he said, yeah, this takes place on Christmas Eve. So I'd really love for there to be a holiday element there somewhere. And I was like, oh, wow, I, I, that was the last thing on my mind. And uh, but, I, you know, I'm like, well, that's going to be an interesting challenge, but also uh, a great opportunity to do something really unique. And that's like one of the things I love about Dan um, and working with him is that he's got a really creative genius. And yeah. He's not, um, he doesn't see things the way that I think most people do and certainly not the way that my brain works. So he always ends up, you know, kind of giving me a challenge that pushes me somewhere new that I wouldn't have otherwise gone. And it always ends up being really cool. And so I just, I love knowing that like whenever I work with Dan, it's, he's going to bring the best out of me. Yeah, the music is the perfect complement for the thrilling ride that this movie undergoes. And, you know, filmmaking is such a collaborative art form. How different is that spotting session when you're working with a director who you've had these prior relationships with as opposed to somebody that you might be working with for the first time? Yeah, I think, you know, when you're working with somebody that you've known and, and there's a comfort, you know, you're, you're not as uh, I think when you've met somebody for the first time, it's a little bit more nervous. You're not you, know, you're, you don't know each other personally as well yet. You haven't been through the trenches of making a, a film together, um, which that in, a, in and of itself is a very bonding experience, you know. So um, and you don't know, you know, yet what, a, you know, a director who you've not worked with, you know, what their sensibilities are as well. Um, but with, you know, in this case with Dan and having known him for so long, um, you know, it's kind of like you can just cut right to the chase. And, and I think that there's a, um, you know, no one's worried about hurting the other person's feelings. You know, yeah. we can just speak openly about is this working? Is it not working? Why? And um, and and I think that that's that kind of that ease uh, and that rapport does help um, the process, you know. Um, but, you know, I've it, it seemed it's so interesting, you know, by the time I'm done with the film, it, and with very rare exception, I feel like I've always like made a new friend at the end of the process. You know, it really is an amazing experience and um, to, to create something like this with somebody. I also imagine that typically you're given the script, you start to formulate ideas of where you want to incorporate music to heighten this narrative, but it's during that editing process and after seeing the actors' performances where things really start to take shape. How do the performances of the cast in your lucky day influence your work? Oh, it influences everything. I mean, 
for me, I I usually get a script. I didn't in this case, but a yeah. lot of times I don't get a script in the beginning. Yeah, he shot it was so quick. He shot it in yeah. 16 days. I didn't even know the movie had been shot, you know, until I, I read about it in a trade. And then I, I called Dan and said, hey, and he's like, hey, I was about to call you, you know, uh, yeah, we've got this movie. So, you know, everything influences me, um, you know, when I see the cut, that's really, really important. The pacing, you know, the, the flow of the edit, the color of the film uh, and, and any sound design that might be in there. And then especially, you know, the, the acting, the, the cast and, and their performances. Um, in this case, you know, there was these great moments um, of, you know, really interesting conversations, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in like an action, you know, thriller. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, you kind of, you know that you're going to have the action sequences. And in this case, we had the interesting blend of the holiday um, vibe as well. But then, you know, there was like these really cool introspective conversations about, you know, what would you, you know, that, that old question, what would you do if you had a million dollars, you know, and w the, the exploration of everyone's justification for what they were doing, which was not necessarily, you know, good behavior, you know, and, uh, and, but everyone has their reasons. And I thought that that was such a fascinating aspect of the film. Um, and so, uh, you know, that opened up a whole avenue of, I think, really kind of delicate uh, string writing that, you know, I, we wanted there to be music underneath those scenes. Um, yeah. And we also didn't want uh, it to be too intrusive, but there needed to be something there. Um, and then also just some very cool textual writing, you know, and, and creating an ambience where these conversations had the, the gravitas that, that they needed. So like you're just saying, you know, one of the major differences between the short and the future is now it takes place on Christmas Eve. And when you think of holiday music, you think of something more cheerful, but this is a really dark, gritty thriller. How are you able to find those moments when you can incorporate, you know, those the elements of holiday music and that nostalgia while making it work for this narrative? And how did you do that so seamlessly? You know, that is that it was a challenge to know exactly when and how much to bring those elements in. Um, you know, when we finally watched the film as a whole, we had basically, I'd written a score and there was there, every scene was, was essentially finished. And uh, the editor, Nick, and, um, and then Dan came over to my studio and we sat and watched the entirety of the film and got a sense of, okay, how is this working as a whole? And that was, um, you know, Dan really, it's, it, he's such an instrumental part and, and, and it's such a collaboration between he and I. Um, and those were exactly the types of questions that were being asked, you know, do we need more of the holiday vibe in certain spots? And, and that was the case. We did decide that, you know, there's holiday songs that you hear throughout as well that we are working around. But there were moments where we felt like, gosh, this is almost getting a little too dark for too long. Like we want to have a little more fun with this. And so, um, you know, there's there's a we we tended to in some of the really like really kind of horrific moments. Um, for example, when when you know Cody wakes up and and he's laying there next to this you know face that's that's uh, pretty pretty gory and pretty horrific, um, you know that was originally a very very dark piece of music, um, as one would expect. But that was one of those moments where you know Dan said, "I really think that this would be a good time to do something a little different." And that was one of the last cues that we finished. Um, we went back and forth on that cue probably more than any any other in the film to be honest and um just getting it just right and striking that balance of this kind of holiday choral thing with some you know more traditional orchestra and then these really dark textures and sounds that you've been kind of exposed to already in the film and uh, and weaving that together so you know i really leaned on dan heavily for his guidance on that um and then yeah you know you just watch the movie and especially when you watch it with somebody else that is so key you know, I sit here and I, I see it again and again and again, but as soon as you get a couple of other bodies in the room and you're and you're all watching it together, mm -hmm. it's amazing how it exposes the mistakes like just like that. So. You, you did a brilliant job at that. And, you know, you actually had more time to score this project than they did to actually film it. What are those some of the benefits and challenges that pre presents you as a composer? Yes, I, you know, I'm used to the, being the guy who only has two weeks to do that, you know, and, and you're like, how am I going to do this? And and uh, so it was a reversal this time around where um, we had the luxury of time and um, it, it changes everything because, I mean, there's something to be said for, about your first instincts. So when I'm scoring a project that has very little time, I almost don't even have any time to like think I just have to get going. And 
you know, and I have a lot of usually a lot of fear you know, driving me to, uh, you know, okay, let's get this going. What are we going to do? And, you know, I'm searching for that little kernel, that idea that's going to blow the entire score up into, you know, that, that little, it's almost like unlocking a, a lock or something. It's like, what is the key here to figuring this out? Um, so when you have a little more time to, to focus on that, though, it's nice. And, and that's what we had here. You know, we, we had the luxury of, you know, taking our time, not being rushed, getting to see the film in its you know, entirety, and then going back and fixing things that maybe aren't great. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to like get it done and you don't have time to really go back and do too much, you know, again. And so, you know, there's been times where I'm watching a film that I've uh, scored or something and I'm like, oh man, I wish I had done this scene a little differently or, mm. or, you know, but, uh, you know, that's just the nature of the, the job where it's, um, commerce and creativity are, are meeting and you have schedules. So, uh, but yeah, we were very fortunate on this.